Nefertari, or Nef, as her friends call her, was getting worried. Her rich friend Anna Delvey had her credit card rejected for embarrassingly the 12th time. They had just spent almost $300 for dinner at the fancy Italian restaurant, Sant Ambroia's. Neff works at the concierge at New York City's 11 Howard Hotel, so she wasn't exactly rich. Her friend was known to throw $100 bills around like it was nothing, but all of a sudden, she had no cash, and her cards were all getting declined. Neff knew deep down that she probably has to cover the bill this time. As she sweated, she quietly transferred money from her savings to cover the bill, and that's when Anna asked if she can cover for them and that she'd pay her back ASAP. The concrete jungle of New York City is where dreams are made and lost. Obviously, making lots of money is usually the ultimate goal for people that move to the city, but that's not how things went for Anna Delvey. She got people to believe that she was a wealthy trust fund baby. She tricked banks and people in high society out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. But just how did she do it? Before moving to New York to run one of the wildest scams imaginable, Delvey had been an intern in the fashion department of a public relations firm in Berlin. This was most likely where all of her knowledge and idea of living the high life came from. After that internship, Anna went to Paris and landed a coveted position at the French culture and fashion magazine, Purple. In Paris, she became close with the magazine's editor-in-chief, Oliver Zam, and André Soreva, one of the owners of Le Baron, a famous nightclub in Paris. According to reports, this is the same time she started to figure out how to tell her lies. When Delvey moved to New York at first, she spent time at 11 Howard in Soho for a while. That's when she first slipped a $100 bill to Neff, and that's when their friendship first began. Delvey booked into a Howard Deluxe room back in February 2017 at a cost of around $400 a night. When Delvey would slip by Neff's table, she would almost always give her a $100 tip. According to Neff, Delvey gave $100 to almost everyone, even her Uber drivers. She also wouldn't allow Neff to reach for her credit card, because on Neff's description of Delvey, she was strangely mannered for the typical rich person she encountered. Apparently, Delvin wasn't exactly nice, but she also wasn't mean, and she knew exactly the right people to know. She also knew all the cool places to go in the city. Neff figured out that she didn't need her concierge experience. She needed a friend. Delvey came across as a secret princess, except her fairy tale was set in modern day New York City. While Delvey was in New York, she wasn't just not working. Well, she had to look like she had something going on. She would tell people she was working towards her idea of launching a private club that was geared towards art. It was supposed to be along the lines of Soho House, the type of club that caters towards hand-picked exclusivity instead of just using money as a differentiator. Neff became Delvey's almost de facto secretary. She'd help her organize her business launches and dinners at restaurants throughout the city. Delvey slowly drew Neff into her life. She would often invite her to different spa treatments such as massages, cryotherapy, or manicures, all on Delvey's dime, of course. Delvey pretty much lived like a celebrity with no limits on her spending. For example, she paid $4,500 for a package of personal sessions with a personal trainer. That's just one example. Delvey was always at the pinnacle of New York nightlife. She would be at parties dressed to the nines with dresses made by brands such as Balenciaga and Versace. She was constantly meeting rich and important people and making new connections. To anyone that would listen, she would tell them she has 60 million euros tucked away in her trust fund overseas. And everyone believed her. Because why not? It's New York City. It's a place where there are plenty of rich kids running around with trust funds. In the world Delvey threw herself in, everyone in that circle were all friends on the superficial level only. Everything was taken at face value. But it's rare for people to really know the whole truth about anyone else. And this was the environment that worked perfectly for Anna. For example, Delvey one time convinced Michael Zufu Huang, the founder of Beijing's M. Woods Museum, to go on a trip together to Venice. She convinced him to go to the Venice Biennale, a large international art exhibition held every two years. She charmed Huang enough for him to book the plane tickets first. <laughs> and oh yeah, of course she asked him to get the hotel in Venice as well on his credit card. Of course she'd pay him back ASAP because she had trouble that day getting money out of her big trust fund overseas. Huang did notice one funny thing though. Delvey only ever paid with cash, it seems. When they got back from the trip, he asked her to pay him back, and 
Just like everyone else, she promised to pay him later, all the way until he just forgot about it. This method worked for a lot of her rich friends. They tend to forget about the money Delvey owed them. Rachel Williams was another one of Anna's friends who was scammed by Anna, and Rachel was nowhere rich. She was supposedly Anna's best friend. In an interview with Harper's Bazaar, she said that she never saw signs from Anna to think that she was someone living a lie. She claimed that Anna was just weirdly socially inept, but also very charismatic. They both had taken a trip to a luxury resort in Marrakech, Morocco, and Rachel ended up paying a whopping $62,000 on her credit card. It wasn't exactly a one-time fee. It was just one thing after another. First it was the villa, then it was the flight. Williams had to pay around $4,000 for both their flights. She didn't want to say no because she wanted to go on the trip too. She never felt that she wasn't going to get paid back by Anna, but it only got worse when they got to Marrakech. Anna picked out $1,300 worth of dresses. As for their hotel bill, it cost a whopping $52,000. According to Rachel, Anna hired a private butler tour guides, cars, and tennis lessons every morning. Anna assured her, however, that she would wire her over $70,000 to make sure all the expenses were covered. Of course, Anna didn't pay her back. Delphi made up stories of how her family built their fortune. She told some people that her father was a diplomat for Russia. To a lot of people, that just meant money from corruption. To some people, she'd tell that she was a titan in the oil industry. There was also the story that her family was big in antiques in Germany. Another one was that they had a successful solar panel business, but the simple truth was none of this was true. Her father was a truck driver who later worked as an executive at a transport company. When the company became insolvent in 2013, he opened a heating and cooling business that specialized in energy efficient devices. And her last name wasn't even Delvey at all. Her real last name is Sorkin. Delvey was her mom's maiden name. She wasn't from Germany. She was born in 1991 in Doma Dodovo, a working class satellite town southeast of Moscow in Russia. Her mom owned a small convenience store before becoming a full time housewife. Her German story came about because her family moved to Germany in 2007 when Anna was 16. Anna was described by her German classmates as a quiet girl who had a difficult time speaking the language. When Anna graduated from high school in 2011, she moved to London to attend school. Her parents, who trusted her and had high expectations for her, paid for her to go to school. But instead, Anna dropped out and returned to Berlin where she started her new life as Anna Delvey. How did Anna completely fool New York's high society? And why did she do it? Anna admitted it was simply so easy to fool everyone into believing that she was incredibly wealthy. Anna pretty much figured out that people are easily gullible when you look and spin like a millionaire. She basically distracted people with shiny objects to distract them from the truth. Her tool was with large wads of cash that made her look like she had a lot of money. Even though she'd throw around hundreds when people were watching, Anna would always trick her rich friends into paying the big bills, such as hotels and expensive dinners. She would come up with a ton of different excuses. A lot of times, she would claim that she lost her wallet or that she accidentally checked her wallet in with her luggage, and her friends would have no other choice but to cover the bill when she asked, because of course, they're rich too. They can't look poor and stingy, and plenty of people in high society failed to see the red flags. Sorokin would routinely claim that there was difficulty moving her assets from overseas. Every day, it'd be a new story. She would laugh it off as forgetfulness when her friends pressed her to pay them back, and they'd give her more time because Anna always promised to pay them back twice as much. Based on her interviews, Anna made it seem like she was just faking it until she made it. And according to her, she believed that success would have really come to her one day. She did set up a lot of meetings because she really believed success was going to happen for her. She just needed time and money. Anna claimed that she was completely misrepresented in court by the prosecution. According to her, the motive wasn't for stealing money, nor was it just to be a wannabe socialite. She explained that her motive was never just about the money. What she wanted was the power. Anna's hotel bill were the first loose threads of her fraudulent schemes that unraveled in November of 2016. What finally got her was applications for big loans. Anna submitted documents claiming a net worth of 60 million euros in Swiss accounts to City National Bank. That was her attempt in getting a $22 million loan. She claimed that she wanted the loan in order to finance the space for her private club idea. And in the next month, she submitted the same documents to Fortress Investment Group in the same attempt to get a $25 million to $35 million loan. When Fortress asked her for $100,000, Anna convinced City National to extend her $100,000 line of credit. Apparently, 
She was afraid of Fortress's decision to send representatives to Switzerland to check her story, where she had no assets whatsoever. So Anna stopped the entire process. Fortress had kept 45 grand for their expenses and they returned $55,000. She wired that to a Citibank account that she used for her own personal expenses. She then deposited $160,000 worth of bad checks into the same Citibank account and managed to withdraw $70,000 in cash. And this was how she managed to pay off her stay at 11 Howard. And this explains why she only used cash. Anna checked into several other hotels in New York. However, the managers began to get suspicious of her as she wouldn't be able to give them a proper working credit card for any incidental charges. Anna would tell the managers that she would wire money, but when the money transfers she promised didn't arrive, the hotels would kick her out and keep her belongings. When the police tracked her down in 2017, Anna was arrested on six charges of grand larceny for scamming wealthy New York City individuals and several hotels. It was true that she had falsified some bank records, but she and her lawyers claimed that it was only because she had a big dream. According to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, her scams totaled to roughly $275,000. In April of 2019, Anna was found guilty on four counts of theft of services, three counts of grand larceny, and one count of first-degree attempted grand larceny. She was acquitted of two other charges. She was not found guilty on another charge of attempted grand larceny in the first degree for the attempted $22 million loan she tried to get. And she was found not guilty for scamming her friend Rachel out of $60,000 for their Morocco trip. On May 9th, 2019, Anna was given a sentence of 4 to 12 years in state prison, fined $24,000, and ordered to pay restitution of $199,000. Anna spent 19 months in jail at Rikers Island and 21 months in prison at Albion Correctional Facility. At the end of February 2021, she was released from prison. In a New York Times article, Anna simply said that she wasn't sorry. She said, quote, I'm not sorry. I'd be lying to you and to everyone else and to myself if I said I was sorry for anything. I regret the way I went about certain things. She simply claimed that she was going to pay everyone back, eventually. All it was going to take was a bit of time. Here's what's next. 